season one of the weekly Backyard Space Show. I'm your host, Kyle, and uh, some of you might know me from the Facebook forums, um, but anyways, I'll be hosting this episode. Before we begin breaking down our topic of the day, I want to mention what the show is really going to be about. Uh, the Backyard Space Show is obviously, like I said, going to be weekly. Um, it's going to come on at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is where our time is right now. Uh, but for everyone else, it's 11.30 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, unless, of course, we say otherwise. But uh, anyways, the channel will discuss astronomy, astrophotography, observations, telescopes, mounts, equipment, and their reviews. Uh, as well as the latest in astronomical and scientific news and research. And last but not least, all things that have to do with BSP. Including our weekly announcements, uh, as well as where, where we will begin promoting our semi-monthly giveaways. Where you can uh, get sweet astro gear, either used or refurbished or new. As well as announcing the winners of said contest. So, with that out of the way, let's begin. Gonna go over some of the uh, couple of the latest news stories uh, that we can pull up. First off, on November 17th, NASA announced the launch of an Atlas V rocket with Gozar, which is a new technology that will collect data used in real time uh, for critical weather forecasting and warning applications. Gozar will be a proving ground to facilitate research to operations, engaging the forecast and warning the community and for pre-operational demonstration and evaluation of simulated Gozar products. The Gozar series will make available 34 atmospheric, land, ocean, solar, and space weather products for the forecasting and warning community. Uh, the ground system support will be critical to the Gozar mission. Uh, the NOAA has developed a state-of-the-art ground operation system to receive data from the Gozar spacecraft generate real-time Gozar products. So for, if you couldn't guess, it's the, uh, it's the satellite that uh, will help with weather forecasting. Got that from the NASA website and skyandtelescope.com. Okay. Let's see. November 9th, astronomers detected a supermassive black hole in a stripped-down galaxy speeding away the near-fatal close encounter in the center of a galaxy cluster. Astronomer Jim Condon and his colleagues at the NRAO discovered this giant black hole, stripping away most of its galaxy and fleeing from a large Jabba the Hutt type elliptical. The results were originally published in the Astrophysical Journal. About 30,000 light years from a brilliant massive elliptical galaxy shown a surprisingly luminous source of radio waves. These radio waves were a dead giveaway that there laid a massive black hole. Even more surprising, they discovered that this large radio source sat on its own little galaxy, which has the mass of 6 billion suns, which is less than 1% of the Milky Way's mass, and a, a typically tiny to be a hosting a supermassive black hole. So in the end, Condon and friends' findings suggest that the most likely scenario which occurred is that the speedy galaxy was once a normal galaxy which fell into the gravitational well around the Jabba the Hutt elliptical at the cluster's center and came very close to being destroyed, passing within 3,000 light years of the elliptical's core, but managed to come out the other side in a slingshot pass. During passing most of the galaxy, stars and gas were stripped by the gravitational tidal forces, but the supermassive black hole survived. So what now? Conan says what's left of the galaxy is still trailing debris and will eventually see star formation, so in about a billion years, the black hole will become invisible, wandering undetected through intergalactic space. The source for that, the Sky and Telescope. Third story. November 4th, thanks to two aggressive search programs, the count of near-Earth asteroids has soared past the 15,000-object milestone. Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center announced that the discovery of asteroid 2016 TB57, and with that new find, the MPC's catalog of all known near-Earth asteroids reached the new 15,000 object threshold. Very comforting news. That's from uh, Sky and Telescope as well. 
lastly, uh, November 22nd, after years of unwarranted hype and dubious experimental claims, the M-Drive, an impossible pro propulsion device that claims to produce thrust while violating Newton's law of motion, has received its first published peer-reviewed paper. A team of researchers from the NASA-affiliated Eagle Works Lab published a paper describing a series of tests on the M-Drive. They say their methodology accounted for nearly all possible errors and returned results indicating that the device produced thrust, apparently violating Newton's laws of motion. The drive works by bouncing microwaves around the inside of a cone-shaped chamber, apparently producing thrust even though, no, even though nothing is being emitted from the device. However, critics have compared the M-Drive to trying to move a car by getting inside and pushing on the windshield. This violation of scientific laws has generated criticism from the scientific community ever since the device was first proposed in the early 2000s. But with this new paper published in the Journal of Propulsion and Power, the researchers have declared the initial have cleared the initial hurdle on the path to legitimacy. This uh, doesn't necessarily mean the M drive will work, but it, but that it has passed peer review, meaning other scientists have examined their data and methodology and declared them sound. Quite an interesting story, and possibly the future of spacecraft engines. More can be read on this article at Astronomy Magazine's website. Now let's move on to our uh, episode's topic today, choosing your first telescope. When a person begins growing an interest in astronomy or astrophotography, choosing your first telescope can be a daunting task. Googling for telescopes obviously usually gives you uh, thousands of results and you're lost already. There's many, there are many op, uh, telescope types, bargains and deals, combos and bundles, and unfortunately a lot of cheap telescopes that will only disappoint. Today we will break it down and talk uh, first about the main telescopes that you'll likely hear about, uh, then discuss which telescopes to purchase depending on what you plan to do. We will also go through whether you should buy bundles or separately, and then go on to discuss more advanced subtopics. So you've made it this far then you may have very well likely seen the different types of telescope names such as refractors or reflectors which are sometimes known as Newtonians or uh, Dobsonians and there are also the catadioptric or compound telescopes such as Cassegrains which uh, include the Schmidt Cassegrain, the Maxitov Cassegrain, Ritchie Cretions and so on. So let's start in order. Refractors are typically the old standby in astronomy as they were the first telescopes invented. The first designs for a refracting telescope were invented in uh, 1608 by German Dutch glass and lens maker Hans Lippershe. Many people have never heard of him, and most that do think about it would say, <coughs> would say Galileo, which uh, in many aspects uh, is true, I mean, in astronomy. Uh, Galileo uh, you know, it was Hans Lippershey, he may have designed a refracting optical tube, but it was Galileo who, inspired by Hans's work, uh, improved upon the design and turned his uh, optical tube toward the heavens in 1610, making him the first person to see the lunar surface, the moons of Jupiter, and the rings of Saturn. His reflecting telescope was only about two inches in diameter and very crude hand-grinded glass lenses. And up until a couple decades ago, telescopes advanced uh, to an amazing degree, but the cost remained too high for the average person to own or utilize the system. But because of new mass manufacturing techniques, uh, enabling companies to pump out lenses and mirrors on a production line, the cost was driven down. A refractor works by uh, using lenses instead of mirrors, and there are many refractors out there, but refractors suffer from what's called chromatic aberration, which is where the lens fails to bring the different colors all to a central focal point, therefore causing discoloration rings around very bright objects, such as the moon or bright stars. Because of the lowering of manufacturing costs, grabbing a refractor with an achromatic lens is, is not that expensive. Uh, achromats are, uh, use special lenses which help account for some of the chromatic aberration are the most widely made lens assembly. 
visual observation, an acromat is more than sufficient for those needs, and people do use them for imaging purposes. However, if you want to spend a little more, you can purchase a refractor known as an apochromatic, which uses doublet, triplet, quadruplet, and so on to majorly reduce chromatic aberration. Typically, these types of optics are more expensive to produce and of much higher quality glass. Acromats are corrected to bring two wavelengths, such as red and blue, into focus on the same plane, whereas apochromatics are corrected to focus three wavelengths, such as red, green, and blue, and to focus on the same plane. Companies such as Astrotech produce a 65mm quadruplet refractors with a fourth lens meant to be a field flattener to gain cleaner astrophotos. With only a few hundred, as well as doublet apos, 72mm, and triplet, triplet 80mm apos for a couple hundred more. But, there, but they are only one of the many companies who produce an excellent achromatic and apochromatic refractors. Refractors typically cost, cost the most per inch of aperture, making larger diameter refractors out of reach for most of the working adults. But a small 60 to 80 millimeter refractor is great for visual use and typically the most iconic telescope when you think of telescopes. And it is the benchmark of most amateur astronomers and astrophotographers. Refractors can also typically be used for astronomical viewing, but also for terrestrial viewing as well. A line of acromats I'd like to show you an example of for is very good for beginners are the uh, ST series. ST stands for short tube, and uh, this is an 80 millimeter refractor here. Let me show you. Sorry about that, folks. This is a uh, an Orion version of the short tube 80 millimeter and uh, believe it or not this is only the tube itself along with uh, I believe it comes with a binder maybe I'm not sure what the deal is right now but it's typically $199 um, let's see here this guy's But anyways, that's uh, one example of a nice refractor. They are nice little cheap acromats that use singular refracting lenses. They come in sizes from 80 millimeter in diameter, uh, as well as 102 millimeter and 120 millimeter and 150 millimeter. They're designed for wide field uh, visual observations of deep sky and basic astrophotography of these objects. They are not suited for planetary viewing due to the short focal length, typically around an F. Five, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but the chromatic aberration typically on bright objects, you know, planets will have a lot of it if you're trying to image it. But in DSO imaging, nothing can beat these small refractors. Um, so let's move on to our next uh, type. So reflector telescopes use mirrors instead of lenses to view celestial objects. The idea of using curved mirrors like lenses actually dates back to the 11th century Arab scholar Hassan ibn al-Hazm, or al-Hazm, uh, as he was known, who revolutionized the use of optics in his book Kitab al-Manazir, or the Book of Optics. A reflector known as a Gregorian was designed by a man named James Gregory in 1633, but uh, and built by Robert Hooke in 1673, but the one most credited for the first practical reflecting telescope is none other than uh, Isaac Newton uh, in 1668, which is most commonly known as the Newtonian design, which is the most widely used uh, reflector telescope around today. There's a variation of the design known as a Dobsonian, but this change only applies to the mount, which changes the telescope from an equatorial mount, which follows the rotation of the Earth on one axis, to an altazimuth mount, which uses altitude and azimuths to move. Reflectors are by far the cheapest telescope per inch of aperture, and for a few hundred, uh, you can own a light bucket of a telescope. Um, 
reflector design does not suffer from chromatic aberrations such as a refractor design, but it does suffer from coma or, uh, or chromatic aberration, which is inherent in telescopes which use mirrors. It causes distortions or elongations of the stars near the outside of the field of view. However, most manufacturers produce coma correctors to fix this. Reflectors use a primary mirror which reflects light through a smaller secondary mirror set at 45 degrees which focuses the light outside of the telescope tube through a focuser and then to an eyepiece. A cheap four and a half inch Newtonian design usually with an equatorial mount can be had for between $99 to $300 from companies such as Orion, Mead, or Celestron. With reflecting designs, collimation must also be performed. This is a procedure of aligning the primary mirror which needs to be done before first use and between uses to keep proper alignment for a quality image. One has to avoid what's called Bird Jones telescopes. It is a Newtonian reflector with a spherical primary mirror and a poor quality lens supposed to correct the spherical aberration of the mirror. This design, however, does not work. Um, that's why you should try to look for one with a parabolic mirror. Uh, typically, you know, obviously going to cost more than the sphericals, but trust me, it's a lot better. Uh, Skywatcher makes a P line of uh, 130p, 130p BS, and 150p. Uh, they use the parabolic mirror only, but uh, many manufacturers do sell quality reflector telescopes with parabolic mirrors, such as the one behind me here is an Orion 8 inch um, Dobsonian mount. You know, you can usually grab those things for two, three, three hundred dollars, six hundred dollars. You know, depending on what you know, um, what you get with them. So, meta diopter uh, telescopes, or what's known as compound telescopes, are typically a combination of both lenses and mirrors folded into a more compact tube assembly. A common compound telescope style are the Cassegrains, such as Schmidt Cassegrains of initial design stem from the Schmidt camera, which was invented by Bernard Schmidt in 1930. Today's Schmidt Cassegrain design starts with a glass corrector lens at the front of the tube assembly which corrects the spherical aberration caused by the spherical primary mirror at the rear of the tube. Another variation is the Maxutov uh, Cassegrain developed by Soviet-era Russian optician Dmitry uh, Dmitrovich Maxutov in 1941. Um, like the Schmidt, it also uses a glass lens at the front, of, front opening. However, it is much thicker and is slightly a negative men meniscus lens. One trait inherent to these designs is high focal lengths in a short tube and higher focal ratios in the F9 to F15 ranges, especially Maxitov, which one company's uh, six inch tube sports a 2700 millimeter focal length, making them ideal for planetary observation. These telescopes can sometimes also be used for terrestrial viewing and photography. There are a few other variations of the compound designs, such as Dahl Kirkham's and uh, reflective flat Cassegrains, such as the Rich Grecian, uh, which is also the design is used in the Hubble Space Telescope. The other Cassegrains usually use parabolic mirrors, whereas an RC uses hyperbolic mirrors, and no corrector lens like the Schmidt and Maxitov. However, for someone looking to purchase their first telescope, these designs are much too complicated to maintain and align than a typical design. Schmitz and Maxitovs range in the price ranges between the large aperture Newtonians and lower end apochromatic refractors. Now that we've gotten through all of that and we've covered the basic styles of telescopes out there, now we have to narrowly avoid what's commonly known with those of us just starting to search for their first setup as telescope paralysis. Decide which style, brand, or deal that's being offered fits you. If you are strictly wishing to start off with visual astronomy, which we suggest for those with no experience uh, whatsoever in astronomy to start off with, and if astrophotography becomes an interest later, you can always upgrade. Um, 
but for visual observations, a Newtonian style telescope on a Dobsonian ultra zenith mount can't be beaten. For a very low price, one can even get what's known as a push to system where a hand controller coordinates, you know, where to push the telescope depending on the celestial object to be selected. On the low end, Orion sells a tabletop six inch push to Newtonian for around four hundred and seventy nine dollars. But a classic the uh, Dobsonian without the push to can be had as cheap as $279 and lower for a 6 to 8 inch aperture. However, for those looking uh, to do no work at all and let the mount be your workhorse, uh, go to Dobsonian. Uh, go to Dobsonians actually do exist. So, you know, they're usually starting in prices uh, pretty high up on the ladder, like over a thousand usually. But, uh, you know, long. Long exposure astrophotography is out of the question uh, with these types of mounts due to their alpha zenith, uh, the way they work. But short exposures such as planets can be taken with cameras as small as a smartphone. Uh, the reflector style will range in ratios uh, between an F5 and an F7, which is an intermediate area that allows for good planetary, lunar, and the larger bright sky, you know, the deep sky objects, and, uh, and even solar with you add on a solar filter but you know and now let's say you've dabbled in visual astronomy maybe you've even owned a small reflector or a Dobsonian and you do want to go for long exposure photographs you know now is the time to make sure you purchase or you have already purchased a motorized go-to equatorial mount as even go-to alpha zeniths uh, suffer from image shift uh, making it more difficult for accurate photos Depending on your budget, telescopes and mounts can vary wildly in price, but for your first foray into photogra photo photographic astronomy, you'll want to grab an achromatic refractor to gain wide field shots, which are a good practice as you continue up the astrophotography ladder. An 80mm short tube, like we showed you earlier, can be purchased, like I said, for $199, and you can get a Bresser Exos 2 go-to mount for under $600. So there are combo deals for astrophotography that includes the telescope and the mount, with cheaper ones such as the Skywatcher Star Adventure Astro Package for $329, but better systems such as the Orion 80mm ED Doublet Refractor on a 30 pound capacity Sirius mount for around $1,500. With this hobby, each telescope does do a specific job, but there are exceptions to the rule with specialty and often expensive modified telescopes. Refractors typically tend to be great for wide field view with buying astrograph refractors, but cheaper, uh, more visual based ones can have high magnifications depending on their focal length. So, uh, refractors, reflectors are often the middleman between refractors and catadioptric. They range in the focal lengths around f5, making them superb for views both wide field and high magnification. They are especially useful for visual astronomers and because their price per inch av aperture is so low, to get large light bucket Newtonians or Dobsonians is, is easy for uh, even the most budget-minded astronomer. Catadioptric, specifically Cassegrains, tend to always have high focal lengths, making them great for planetary views, but really crappy for wide field views. There are specialty Cassegrains, such as Celestron's uh, Edge HD series, which can be used with the lens set known as the Hyperstar to uh, turn it from an F10 from high magnification to an F2.8 super wide field telescope. But you know, a lot of all this, it all depends on preference, and in the end, it's all up to you which direction you want to go with it. As we said, there are many telescopes, mounts, and packages out there. And it can surely become a daunting task pilfering from pages and pages and pages of it. But we hope that our episode today may have helped to clarify some of it and help you to make a more informed decision. But as always, use your own judgment and always do your own research. There are a lot of good telescopes out there, but the better the scope, the higher the price. And in this field of hobbies, you do get what you pay for. So always avoid the cheap department store telescopes. Because although a telescope set with an optical tube, mount, and filters for $50 might be tempting, uh, rest assured those are less than $50 optics that are put into that telescope. 
So at the best, you you know you don't expect to get more than out of focus views of the moon at best. So uh, if you can manage to get your hands on a decent telescope, regardless if you're getting into the hobby or you're just doing op visual observations, or you're just moving on towards astrophotography, you are sure to find a challenging yet a rewarding hobby that opens the doors of the heavens of love and bestows the beauty of our universe right before your eyes. Beautiful. With all that said, we hope you enjoyed our first episode of our weekly webcast, and we hope that you uh, tune in next time. If you liked our video, please uh, click like here on uh, YouTube and on Facebook, and remember to share. Drop us a comment below or a question, and thanks for tuning in to the Backyard Space Show. Once again, I'm Kyle, and good night.